Hi everyone, it's Kirk and Michael for our one year anniversary of bi-weekly thoughts. I can't believe it's been a year and you might notice some changes. Um, I will say, oh, by the way, we're changing the name of the show to The Rundown. Um, and I hope through the year, a couple of things. You notice we continue to try to improve the production quality of what we're doing. Um, the content always we're trying to improve. And the takeaway, the feedback we have gotten about this show over the last year, we've been told it's changing our clients and our private practice, their lives. Sincere, sincerely, because we're providing a level of education so they better understand what's going on in the markets. It's helping them to filter all the noise because we try to talk about current events and what's going on because everyone's got an opinion and expert and create a lot of fear and anxiety anxiety so we're trying to filter some of the noise to explain how it may or may not impact you but more importantly you might notice we tend to be a little ahead of the curve on talking points and sort of forecasting of what we're expecting and hopefully you're noticing as we're educating you is we're trying to show you how and what we are going to do to be able to pivot within your plan so it doesn't impact your lives it shouldn't change your lives, it shouldn't change your spending behaviors, it shouldn't change anything about your uh, years going forward because there's a plan for whatever occurs, we're able to pivot. And that's the purpose of the show, is about creating that freedom for people. Yeah, and I think the education for clients especially, we've gotten feedback saying that the videos, the, the homework in the videos help them get back into their plans and really have made them feel more comfortable truly spending what they can spend and not being afraid to retire because they know that all of the things we talk about helps them filter noise from the markets that they're hearing about in the news and they're able to more focus on their plan and how it's going to work for them. It's been great and amazing, sincerely, the amount of people who are now watching the show regularly. Here's the statistics, which we have all the data to track. So of the four, almost 400 people that are now watching this show on a bi-weekly basis, that means of all of our clients, 400 are regularly watching this show, increasing, literally, it's like every two weeks when we put a show out, more and more of you are watching. And we're, they're, they're, they're completing like 82% of these long-winded, Kirk doesn't <laughs> shut up, Kirk constantly inter interrupts Michael show that we're creating, it's amazing. So th thank you for watching and we hope it's really helping. So we thought today would be a great opportunity to revisit what has happened over the last year mm -hmm. and how interesting the markets are behaving as the, mark is, as the economy's reopening, GDP is flying high, retail sales are like record levels, consumer confidence is way up, Everything's kind of going good. And, but what's happening with the markets? And yet, markets are sort of stagnant. I mean, we're, we're at or near all-time highs, but you would assume if, like all those things you just listed, the market would be flying higher. Well, it's not, that's not the case. And just like we said about a year ago, people were asking, well, why is the market ripping higher when we have record unemployment? Businesses are closing. We're in the heart of COVID. We don't know what's going to happen yet. The economy was sh shut down. And the market, closed. the market bottomed and then started taking off higher. People couldn't understand why. We are 72% up from the bottom. And the majority of all that happened when the economy was shut down, right? I, deaths were really high. The pandemic was roaring. And a lot of business, small business was shut down really bad. So to put a date on that, we were at bottom March 23rd, 2020. Right. We were still in the midst of covid not knowing how to treat it, not knowing how to fight it, not knowing what it's going to look like over the next year. As the market was having the best, what was it, 50-day 50, 50 run we've had in history. Yes. Which is a really, really good point too, Michael, right? Is that you can't time this. So could you imagine if you were to time, have time? I know some people around the country may have timed the bottom, but you can't tell me you got back in you at the bot at the bottom you couldn't have and if you didn't get back in within the 50 days of the bottom you missed out on 50 percent of the upside i think mm -hmm. it was right well we met the doctor who timed yes. it on the top he said that he saw this coming he knew that 
uh, people in the news and finance weren't taking this seriously enough, so he sold it at, at the top. He's very proud of himself. Yes. Well, we were meeting with him in like October of last year, yeah. so he had missed a 50 or 60 percent run, <laughs> and we had to explain to him, congratulations, you timed the top, but you missed the bottom, and now you've, you're, compared to where you were at, you're, you're now down. So there's some really interesting things happening in the market right now, which is the opposite of what was happening. So, so, so I think, I think what I'd like to start first is because you kind of led to talking about the chart that we're showing since 19, what was it, 1980 through 2020. We'll remind you, I think we bring this up maybe every fifth show, that um, if you were invested, if you had invested $10,000 in 1980 and you just bought the S&P 500, your $10,000 would be worth $952,000 today. That's what you would have had. If you missed just 50 of the best days, your $10,000 would be $68,000. So the difference between $952,000 and $68,000 is you thinking you can time the market. That's the difference. Just missing 50 of the best days, missing 10 of the best days, just 10 of the best days, Michael, you would have half the amount you would have had if you just stayed in the market. Which this is a really good example of why typically retail investors Loose. underperform consistently in, in any market cycle, uh, uh, bull markets, bear markets, because they try and time things and it, it does not work out well for them. And here's why. The next chart, Michael, is in, in uh, thank Michael for the research. He does all the research for these shows and finds great charts. But you show a five year return, a historical five year return post major market event. And there's depression, severe recession, what is the most dramatic Fed tightening in the past 20 years, and the Great Recession. And you'll notice, Michael, look what's the performance? What happens? So obviously the number one recovery was after the, the Great Depression. Five years later, they're 367% higher. Now I know, and I, I feel like people are quick to forget, back in March people were scared the markets had fallen 30% in 22 trading days. 35% of people, 35% of all people over the age of 65 years old mm -hmm. panicked. And sold and went to cash. And sold the cash, yep. People forget how scary those days are, but then you need to remind them long term, this is what happens after those sharp crashes. Yeah, typically the best performing days, weeks, months are right after the major crash. Which is exactly what we saw after March 2020. Right. So trying to time, it's impossible. It's mm -hmm. impossible. You might do it once in your lifetime. Once! But you're going to be wrong the other four, five, seven times in your lifetime where there's an event. You're going to lose. You just, just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And so the next chart we have here is more about stock picking. People think that they can stock pick. And it's, we like to pick on uh, Jim Cramer a little bit. Uh, Kirk, Kirk and I are not his biggest fans. So he has his, his TV show, which is very entertaining, but like we've said before, he has access to CEOs, CFOs, supply chains, uh, politicians. On, so he has anybody teams you can ask of for, research teams people. of researchers, anybody you can ask for on speed dial. And this is his performance from uh, August 2001 through December 2017. He's underperforming the benchmark by about 50%, a little, a little less than 50%. Just buy the S&P. Because he's stock picking. That's exactly right. So, Michael, um, I, I hope they get the message. I think, people, I think people get it now, right? I think they get the message that you can't stock pick in market time. But what's also interesting is what was driving the markets, really pulling the markets higher during, during post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Right after COVID, when the economy shut down, uh, the economy is shut down, uh, we had real issues and concerns, and, but the market was rallying. What was driving the markets? So tech companies that could thrive even in a stay-at-home environment, so Amazon, Netflix, Google, Facebook, these tech companies that were already the largest five companies in the S&P. Right. Five companies really was, drove the performance. This was a custom tailor-made event for those companies to keep thriving. Right. And so we talked a year ago about how, yes, the S&P is going higher but really it's being pulled by these top five companies. It's not the other 495 aren't doing so well. It's right. these top five pulling the index higher. Right. Well, now we have a, a bit of a reversal. So those top five companies aren't 
doing as well. They're taking a breather. They're starting to fall off a little bit. And the companies from other sectors that are more positively cash flowing, like real estate, consumer staples, uh, utilities, are now doing better. Yeah, they're outperforming tech, right? And in, 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 so we have a, 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 maybe a reversion to the mean a little bit, a, mm-hmm. a, a little bit of a, of a pullback. And part of that is arguably, which I know many of you have talked to us about, is fears of inflation. Because many of these growth companies are performing and being valued. And the price has been driven up based upon future performance projections, mm-hmm. right? And as we see inflation, the potential of inflation, those dollars, those future profits that they're projecting aren't worth as much if the dollar isn't worth as much, right? So if inflation rises, those future projections of tremendous growth isn't worth as much. And so the companies that are actually really making money right now are now performing better right now and pulling back the valuations of those growth companies many of which aren't making co- much money right now mm-hmm. because those future growths, the, the future projections aren't worth as much. Does, like you said, so future cash flows are not worth as much and also these tech companies, these growth companies can't get access to very cheap money to keep burning to grow. So companies like Grubhub who have negative net cash flow, they're, they're spending more money than they're making, while well, their answer used to be, we'll just take on more debt. Debt's really cheap right now. Well, as, as interest rates rise, that's not the case anymore. Grubhub can't go get debt loans at 2% or 1.5% anymore. As interest rates rise, this is going to be, and, and, and that's why it goes back to why you can't stock pick market time. I mean, and, and I wish I would have pulled the data before I'm just blurting this out and hitting you up with this, but <laughs> Apple has been pretty stagnant now for a little while, hasn't mm-hmm. it? Actually, it's pulled back some, hasn't it? It's gotten caught with the other top five companies that they're, right. just, they're, they're taking a breather. They're starting to pull back a little bit because they ran so far during that market recovery after the COVID crash. Do you know how many people think Apple just goes up forever? <laughs> yes. Right? And this is why, so people back then were saying, well, why not just own the top five companies? I'm not saying companies? Apple, by the way, sorry to interrupt. I'm not saying Apple won't go up. But it's, 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 it's pulled back and slowed down. Right, and that's but. why, so a year ago, people were saying, well, why not just own these top five companies? Because they're doing so well. Well, this is exactly why. And it's important to point out these moments in time when diversification is working for you. So why might we see inflation? I think most people understand why there are many that are, are predicting we're gonna see some inflation. And everyone's so afraid of it I would suggest that Michael and I are less fearful of some inflation. Um, and we, I'm not sure, I don't want to speak for Michael, but I'm, we're not in the camp that will see sustained inflation. But we, some inflation is, is not going to be a bad th- thing, particularly for seniors and savers. Mm-hmm. We need to see some inflation. I'd love to see bond interest rates go back up so that we can get a little longer and buy longer term bonds to drive some bigger returns and yield from bonds. But we can't take that risk right now in interest rates going up. I would challenge all of you who may not be our clients or may have some bond funds or clients who have a 401k and still have bond indexes, bond funds in your 401ks. And I would encourage you to look at the value or the performance of your bonds over the last six months and tell me what you see. And it's going to be what we've told you you're going to see as interest rates rise. You're going to see your bond funds way underperforming, losing money, right? Because yields are going up. Right. And your treasury's up 1%, over 1%. And as we've talked before, as as yields start to rise, bond prices fall, and then over time as they get repriced, now you'll, in the future, you'll have bonds actually paying a yield as opposed to your uh, 1.5% tenure today. (laughs) Right, exactly. All right, here we go, ready? So why are people fear, some, so many people are fearful of inflation? I'm going to give you a staggering statistic, a number that I, I, I got to tell you, I had, it blew me away. I, There's some sticker shock. There was yeah. major <laughs> sticker shock here. Ready? 35, 35% of all U.S. dollars in existence right now was printed since March of 2020. 30, 35% of all dollars in circulation right now has been, was printed March of 2020. Or later. Or later. Which at first, when I first saw that, I thought Kirk had pulled some incorrect stat, but when you think about it, they printed 
between it was a seven source. to Very nine credible. trillion dollars and all these care packages, stimulus packages, relief packages since 2020. Yeah. So that makes sense. So quickly, and this is a little bit that we just give a, tell them it's not quite as bad as it sounds. So a lot of people hear printing money and they assume inflation, which technically is what textbooks say, but we're not printing money and handing it all out to people to go spend. Some of it's going to people in stimulus checks, but a lot of it's going to purchase currently existing U.S. debt. So they're trading dollars for debt to provide stimulus in the economy, to pro provide liquidity in the economy. Right. Still not good. Still that, that was overwhelming. I, I read it like three times. I double checked the source. I could not believe the number when I read it. Right. I can't believe I haven't heard it before. And that's why we're probably going to see some inflation, like you said. It's just, it'll come down to, can the Fed control it? And will it be sustained or not? And we'll, we'll find out. Right, okay. So here's another one, a shocking, a, a really shocking number. Maybe a little bit in the weeds, but a really shocking number. Um, we, we talked a lot about US bias or, or behavioral finance and how um, all of us as investors, savers, people who invest in the markets, create these behaviors, these biases that tend to impact our decision making. And one of those major uh, biases that all of us are guilty of, with the exception of Michael, <laughs> right? I mean, he's constantly putting me in check with this one, is our U.S. bias. A tendency to overweight to U.S., significantly overweight, and really underweight international investing. And so, the, and, and for good reason. Look, we've had what, I think it's the longest run of U.S. outperforming international ever, right? Uh, at least since 1970. So we have a chart we can put on the screen here. It's the longest time frame of either U.S. or foreign stocks outperforming each other. Right, but if you look at that chart, you're gonna see there are segments where international wins, um, uh, U.S. wins, right? It just happens to be we've had a long U.S. run. So we all tend, and I've, I, I've watched, witnessed myself as I'm doing allocations. Uh, I had been, and Michael is more of a traditionalist, right? And, and it's good. It's, it, it was good balance that I was really, I was, I was shifting. I, I was really underweight. I was probably underweighting in national a good 15% mm -hmm. to what a traditional Vanguard ETF model would look like, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we've, we've adjusted and we've pivoted and we did that about a year ago and we're being rewarded for it, right? Right. And so what's interesting is we were a little ahead of the trend talking about that because they just came out and said global equity funds have experienced a staggering $313 billion of inflow this quarter. So $313 billion more money inflows have gone into global equity funds, which is the largest on record. So anytime I hear largest, I'm impressed. But when I heard that it was the largest by record by more than double the next largest inflow, yeah. there is clearly, we weren't alone in our thinking. We were just ahead of the curve about a year where we started to... Uh, um, to increase our weighting to international. And there are a lot of reasons it's happening. People are, are realizing the US markets, stock markets are fairly expensive from a valuation perspective. Right. Foreign markets aren't quite as expensive right now. Right. Um, and they're saying, and they're seeing this data here, saying, wow, the US has been outperforming for 13, 14 years now. It's bound to revert at some point. Right. And so they're starting to make that shift. The administration had something to do with that mm -hmm. too, right? Um, part of the reason beyond Michael hounding me to adjust, adjust, <laughs> adjust, get back to a balanced uh, 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 structure, stop making bets. And he's right. Look, everyone's guilty of this, right? So we keep each other, in it's great. That's why we have institutional managers I lean on, I buy signals from, because people have different opinions. There's not just one person making these calls, mm -hmm. right? So it's good. Um, what else you want, Michael? So I think we want to wrap up with before we go to homework. I think we've covered topics for today. If we want to jump to the homework. Yeah, let's do it. So the homework is to go into your plan and it's sort of segmented here. There's different homework if you're still working or if you're retired. If you're still working, the homework is to go into your plan and identify if you're supposed to be saving into your plan, whether it's a 401k, IRA or non IRA, non qualified accounts. So, so that means, let me summarize, you're not working 
I'm sorry, you are working. The first half of this homework is for people who are still working. And if you're still working, we want to make sure that you are saving what you were scheduled to save. Priority. The priority that we're really worried about whether you're saving or not is, and we're going to put up a, a, an example of a plan so you can see it, is go always going to be in your account one. The first account on the spreadsheet is going to be your non-IRA account and you're going to see in parentheses how much you're supposed to be saving of non-IRA money into Fidelity with us. It is critical uh, to your plan, not just to save money so you have it to spend in retirement. There are more variables of why that's those savings, those dollars that you're saving are important to your plan. If we have you saving those dollars, you'll probably notice those dollars are also the first dollars that we're spending once you retire. And that's because those are more tax favorable dollars that's giving us the ability to Roth convert. So that, and it's, it's, like, it's like a levers, and if you, if you pull one lever or miss one lever, it impacts four different parts of your plan. By saving those non-IRA money, you're allowing us to Roth convert, or you're keeping, us, keeping yourself in a lower tax bracket, so a smaller percentage of your Social Security will be taxable, a smaller percentage of your dividends and capital gains will be taxable. In some cases, none of the dividends and capital gains are taxable because we've Roth converted, meaning we have less taxable income we have to take later. As a net result, not only will you have more money because you save more money, but you're gonna pay significantly less taxes every year in retirement, providing you greater cash flow in retirement so your money lasts longer, so you don't outlive your money, or your children end up with more money. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Did right. I say that well? Yeah, and so if you're not saving into the plan like we're expecting you to, let's identify, well, can we start doing that? And if we can't, that might be a problem. Your plan isn't accurate right now. Yeah, it's going to impact your plan if you're not saving. And right. in your review, your next review, we need to talk about it and pivot and understand, and we need you to understand what the implications of that are. Right. So uh, the and we'll bring it up. I mean, we track that. That's the purpose of the review of whether you're on track, where you're falling short, what do we need to do, how do we make adjustments? Yep. The second part of the homework, if you are retired already, so you're no longer saving into the plan, now you're taking funds out of the plan to live on, please look at how much income you're supposed to be getting, your targeted income, and look at your own personal spending to see if you're spending that income or not. Yes. So this is the opposite message. Totally <laughs> opposite. Like, if you haven't retired yet, we're telling you to save the money that was scheduled to be saved. Now I'm t we're going to tell you that if you've retired and you're not spending what, you're so what we're scheduled to give you, then you don't understand the freedom you should have. If we have scheduled you to spend that money, I hope after a year of watching these videos, you now have the confidence to spend those dollars. You're not going to outlive your money. We have contingencies in place to make sure that whatever event occurs, that you're going to be okay, whether it's long-term care, recessions, depressions. We have insured an income. We have insured income. We have uh, long-term care safety nets. Spend the money you were scheduled to spend. One more point to that, Michael. If you look at this column, and we're going to circle the column right now and show you, if you look at the bottom of your plan at the end to see how much money you have left at the end and you have a fair amount of money left at the end, please understand if you want to spend a little more money in a particular year, do it. Spend it. You can afford it. I, you you got to understand you've spent 40 years to save what you have now. And what you spend now, you have to think of dividing it over how it impacts the next 20 to 30 years. So for example, if you're renting a place in Florida and for three months it's gonna cost you $1,000 more a month, I need you to think about what $3,000 in a year, how does that impact the next 30 years of income? Does that change your income? 
Does that change the number that's at the end of your life? So I want you to think of when you're spending money, if you have extra at the end, it's like spending $5,000, $3,000 here, hiring a realtor to sell your property instead of doing it yourself, leasing the car and spending an extra $50 a month or $100 a month for your car, you can afford it. Stop serving money. Let the money serve you. I want you to think of it as like if you had a pebble and you threw a pebble into Lake Michigan, how much does that impact the water? You're not moving anything. There's no ripple effects. If you spend an extra $5,000 a year, how does that impact? Or if you spend $10,000 this year in commissions because you're gonna hire a realtor to sell your place, $10,000 divided over 30 years, is that changing anything? So your kids are gonna end up with what? $20,000, $30,000 left at the end? Less at the end? Serve money. What, Michael, it, I know it's driving you crazy. <laughs> I'm having, it's like eight out of 10 people we meet. What are you doing? I'm having at least one meeting a week with someone saying, oh my gosh, I did not realize how much is left at the end. I should go spend more. And me banging my head off the wall saying, we've told you five times now, this is what's left at the end. Please go spend more. Spend money. What are you doing? Why are you saving money still? Like, I mean, unless legacy is a major priority for the kids. Now, I want to be careful. Don't use legacy for the, uh, for the kids as an excuse to rationalize your anxiety about outliving your money. We all do it. We find these things to hang on to as the excuse why I'm not spending it without recognizing it's just a fear of outliving your money. And if you really are still fearful of outliving your money, let's talk about it in your next review so we can show you why you're not going to outlive your money. Stop pinching pennies. You've spent 30, 40 years to save what you have. The next, overspending a few years here or there isn't going to change the 30, 40 years you, the ship has sailed, you're done, you've won. So Kurt could talk all day about this, obviously, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut him off there. I, no, I can, here's why, one more thing. <laughs> Look, see, so Mike wants to come out. I'm not done because this is, I swear, such a large part of our jobs for our retirees is coaching. It literally is coaching you to spend and let money serve you, to enjoy the retirement you've earned. You put in the hard work to build a plan. You went through the pain. I know it was not difficult. The first three months you were with us as we spent five meetings building your plan and you felt like you totally lost control over everything. You really didn't, but that was your anxiety speaking, right? You should now have that freedom to go enjoy your retirement, please. Please hear us. Enjoy your retirement. So that being said, we're, we're all set for today. Uh, again, we appreciate you guys watching. It's been a year. Happy anniversary. We have learned a lot ourselves. We, we hope this has been helpful for you guys. Have a great week. Take care.